Welcome back to the Photo Banter Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Gagne, and on today's podcast, I speak with photographer and director Greg Hunt. Greg Hunt has worked with brands such as Vans Footwear, DC Shoes, Levi's, Alien Workshop Skateboards, and Patagonia, to name a few. Greg has directed and produced some of the most influential skateboard videos of all time, such as Transworld's Sight Unseen, the DC video, Minefield, and Vans Footwear's first full-length video titled Propeller. He has also directed music videos for artist Cat Power, as well as showcasing his work in the Leica galleries. I grew up watching the skate videos that Greg Hunt produced, so I was really pumped to get a chance to speak with him about his journey with photography and directing and everything that he's kind of accomplished. So I hope you guys enjoy it, and thanks so much for listening. All right, Greg Hunt, welcome to the podcast, man. Uh, really excited to talk to you, dude. I grew up watching your videos, like Sight Unseen, IE, so excited to talk skateboarding, photography, filmmaking. Um, but I guess to start off, man, it's been like a crazy year for everybody, and I've just been kind of, everybody been talking to, man, like, how you been doing, man? Like, how have you kind of been approaching work, life, and everything with the crazy year we've had? <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's great to be here, first of all. Um, second, um, as far as that question goes, it's it's funny that you ask that because when I was walking back to my office, I was actually thinking about how what sort of defines this year for me is waking up at 4.30 in the morning so that I can get a little bit of work done before my son's first first grade Zoom class starts. Wow. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh... Yeah, I saw on your Instagram story today, you're at sunrise editing videos. I was like, man, Greg's really getting after it, dude. <laughs> I, I mean, I am. It's, you know, it's like I've got two. <clears throat> we've got two young boys, uh, six and three, um, which is just a lot of work with them home 24 seven and the six year olds in school, you know, from 830 till two, uh, four days a week on Wednesdays. That's why we're doing this Wednesdays. He gets out at nine. Yeah. But um, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, I work while he's, I, I have luckily, you know, I, I feel really fortunate actually, because we moved into a new place, um, in Burbank and I have a little, it has a little converted garage studio in the back. So I have a full office, yeah. um, set up back here. So he's got a little desk. Um, I luckily have an old laptop. He's able to do his thing on school while I can work. Um, a lot of, the, a lot of the work that I've done this year has been, you know, while he's sort of next to me doing his class and I have one headphone on, one headphone off type of thing where I can kind of listen in. And yeah. If he needs help, I kind of take a break and help him. But to really focus and do creative work, you know, you have to kind of, I've, at least with, with myself, you know, I have to sort, you have to work when you're feeling really inspired and when you can focus. And I have found, I'm more of a morning person. So I've found that um, if I can get to bed at a reasonable time, getting up at you know between four and five gives me two to three hours where i can just have music playing or just have some coffee and kind of zone in and get some good work you know done at the beginning of the day before my kids get get up because you never know what's going to happen when that, when that happens. <laughs> yeah uh, <laughs> i was going to ask you that man because like uh, being in the type of line of work you do being like a creative an artist and then <laughs> On top of that, a lot of the work you do is with skateboarding. Like, how how do you like approach work and like balance your 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 personal life and work? Because like a lot of these guys you're filming are this like young dudes, like in their early twenties, and it's like they don't they don't have a family like you, and they, they're just kind of how, how do you even like balance all that? Because it's got to be a tough thing to do. It's very difficult, you know. Before I had a family, I didn't balance it. That's all I did. Yep. And I think that's to a degree why I was good at what I did because I, it's just, I was all consumed by it. You know, mm -hmm. I basically lived my work, you know, and fortunately I worked with my friends and, you know, so it wasn't like a, I think a life completely out of balance, but, you know, I sort of set myself up because once I did have a family, I had kind of like developed this, type of work that I do that really requires this 24 seven dedication. Yeah. Um, so I had my first boy uh, about a year before propeller came out, he was born in 2014. 
And that last year was a challenge, especially editing that video at home, like an hour long skate film. You know, it took three, three months and having a baby at home uh, or a little kid at home. Uh, it's, it's hard because they don't understand that you're working, you know it's almost easier to not be present at all. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean to have like an office at another place or something mm -hmm. when, when they're young, because when you're there, they, if they're instinctual, so they want to come and hang out or see you or they're sad or lonely or want to play or whatever. And they don't understand if you're on a call or busy doing something. So it's challenging, but you know, you know, th that, that was, um, that's probably been one of the biggest challenges for me in the last five years with skating work, um, with any work really having a family is challenging, but with skating work, especially because of how it's kind of like being a detective, you know, you have to be at 24 hours a day ready at any time to go shoot, you know? Yeah. Because skateboarding isn't like, like, you know, I've, I, most of my career I've worked on like, like commercial video projects and still stuff and everything's like set up like ahead of time and with skating it's kind of a lot more organic would you say like like when yeah. dudes when dudes have the itch and they, they're feeling good and they're feeling right and they're like oh greg i, I want to go hit this rail i want to go hit this spot and it's just kind of it's yeah really or yeah absolutely or it might you know hey I, you know hey that spot up in stanford they're going to tear it down we need yeah. to go tomorrow you know Mm -hmm. where when you know you're 25 or 30 and you don't have a family and that's sort of your whole world that's just what you go do you drive up there for the day but when you have a family it becomes more complicated you know the only thing now that's really provided me to be able to kind of still do this is just vans um having worked with those guys for a while or work, work with them for a while um you know they're understanding a lot of people there have families too and they know that I can't just be out on the streets 24 seven. And then also, you know, primarily Elijah is who I've been working, Elijah Burl is who I've been working with the past couple of years. And he's been really cool about it. Mm. Really understanding like, you know, that I'm not able to be out there. And if for some reason I can't make it, cause a lot of times he'll hit me up at 11 AM. Hey, can we go, I'm gonna go shoot this thing today. And I already have, you know, I have to be home because you know, their mom has some appointment or something like that. And I just can't do it. And he's been really understanding about that. And then also having obviously people help me shoot. That's always important. But uh, now it's more important than ever. Yeah, definitely. And I was excited to talk to you about that video that you just released with Vans. Um, All right. OK, which features Elijah Burrell and uh, Gilbert Crockett. Um, how, how long did you guys kind of work on that project? And like, how did it kind of all come together for you? Was it and, and was it some of it was shot during COVID, I would imagine. Yeah, some of it at the end was shot during COVID. It's a it was a funny uh, process, not not a funny process, but it was very different for me because actually after Propeller in 2015, uh, fall of 2015, I I took a bit of a break from doing skate stuff. I um, stopped working for Vans totally on good terms, but you know, I, I just needed to take a break. It had been 15 years, like full time making skate films, skate videos. And um, so I took a break. And for two years, I was just doing freelance, like uh, mostly like commercial directing and, and cinematography. And I really started to miss it. And then also being fully freelance with a family is really challenging, like supporting a family off yeah. full freelance income is challenging. And I'd sort of always kept in touch with some of the main people at Vans. And when the idea came up of doing a video, uh, Elijah Burrell was getting a shoe and they wanted to do a video with Elijah that would drop when his shoe dropped. So that's kind of what brought me back over to Vans, you know, was to do like a one person video that I could kind of do not necessarily part time, but it's nothing like doing a full team video. And I felt like I could manage it and it would get me back into vans a bit and kind of get me just back around skaters more, which I missed. Yeah. Um, and then he had, you know, a pretty hardcore slump, which pushed that back. And we brought Gilbert in just with the idea that having another uh, person in the video would kind of counterbalance Elijah not having a lot at the time and maybe give Elijah a little bit of a spark and take a little bit off his plate, which it did. And then 
that's kind of when the video really started is when Elijah or and, when Gilbert, when Gilbert came on board about a year ago. Do you think like skaters can kind of feed off each other? Like, especially when you're working on projects like, like that, or even like a team project, like, will you ever show like other guys like, Hey, I'm filming, here's some clips of some other guys and what they're <laughs> doing to keep them in a loop or no. Cause I would imagine, you know, when it's a one, being a one person video, that's a lot of pressure on one person. So maybe <laughs> having someone else on board can kind of in inspire you, like Elijah or Gilbert both ways, I guess, maybe not. I don't know. Yeah, no, I mean it, Elijah and Gilbert, uh, they're, 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 they're pretty tight, you know, and they have a lot of mutual respect. And I think bringing Gilbert on and having kind of someone else in the, you know, in the mix that it's just make basically making it to where it wasn't just an Elijah Burrow video part yeah. or video yeah. just took a lot of pressure off him that I think was kind of eating away at him. And that sort of, you know, that I think was probably contributing to this, this dry spell he was having. So, you know, it's always, you know, everyone's skateboarding is, you know, there's no formula. Everybody is different. You know, yeah. there's people that I've shot with who like to shoot alone, like Heath Kirchhart was notoriously would want to skate alone. He, I, I don't know if I've ever like skated with Heath on a session with other people where we were actually trying to film something. Of course, he comes skating. He wasn't a total weirdo, but <laughs> when it came to filming a trick, Usually it'd be just him, you know, and uh, other people only want to be around. They only want to be in their van, in the van with their with their friends or their team and yeah. uh, with no agenda. You know, like some people really like to have a strict plan. They want to be they're going to meet you at 830 in the morning on yeah. Saturday and they have everything already. And some people are the opposite. They want to they want to just kind of go go with the vibe. You yeah. know, so it really it's 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 never the same twice. Everyone has their own formula for for success. No, it's really interesting. And like you guys made some really cool like behind the scenes videos, kind of little short films about like Elijah and the whole process with all right. Uh, OK, all, what is it? I'm blanking on it. Uh, all right. OK. Um, and one of the videos that showed Elijah, I think they were shooting like a Vans commercial and he was trying to like kickflip into this crazy bank and there was. Yeah, it was like a huge production with like tons of people and he, in the documentary little piece he kind of just talks about like yeah like i was at my lowest point there and i just wasn't feeling it and as like a filmmaker can you kind of you kind of pick up on that like when they're kind of going through those things and like how do you kind of how do they kind of work through it i guess well to be honest that so that was a commercial shoot vans had set up and i was working with Elijah on this video, which were two separate projects. Yeah. And I went, I rented a 16 and went just kind of and lurked around on my own, just thinking like, this is early on in our project before Gilbert. So I was just thinking like, hey, maybe I can get, I can shoot this on 16 and it'll be different than the commercial and we can somehow use it in the yeah. video. I didn't know. I Thinking that he was going to do it, uh, not thinking that that was going to happen. So I say that because I actually with like my with with more commercial bigger production uh work mm -hmm. I try to keep skating out of it you know yeah. unless it's like a vans thing or something that's very skate centered mm -hmm. um it's just it's cuz when you have a, a a shoot that big and say it isn't that that's vans so that's different but say if you have a big commercial for a car company or something and they want skateboarding in it it's going to be like that you know yeah. it's going to be you know 30 people 100 people standing there not a lot of time a lot of people probably communicating to the skater in a way that they're not accustomed to you know mm -hmm. if that makes sense yeah definitely you know, like just kind of i don't whatever it is and a lot of times it just puts the skaters in a compromising position. A lot of times at last minute, they'll want them to put a helmet and pads on or something. And it's sort of like, so I try to not really mix those two worlds if I don't have to, you know? And if I do, I don't know. Um, I, I, don't know. I, I try, I, how can I say this? Like that commercial I think everyone had faith for sure that Elijah would do it, but mm -hmm. there's always a chance that the person isn't going to do it. Yeah. You know? It's a stunt and it's not really like, 
you know, it's, it's with skateboarding, with something like that, it's something that the person's never done and it's unfamiliar and it's, it's, it's a risk. It's a dice roll and it puts a lot on the skateboarder, you know? So it was excruciating for me to be there. Yeah, man. It's intense. I can't imagine having that much pressure on your, on anybody. Um, and you know, one thing I was curious in talking to you about, like when you're kind of working on these projects, uh, be it your new video or propeller or what have you, um, when you kind of begin the project, do you kind of like, like map it out, like how you want to approach it visually? Um, like even because like as me as a photographer, I really enjoy looking at like all the B-roll footage that's in these videos. And like, how, how do you kind of map out the, the visual aspect of like putting these projects together? Is it like you're mapping it out beforehand or it just kind of comes together as you kind of work on it, I guess. Yeah. I, I start mapping it out and trying to really kind of, um, you know, making a, a conscious effort to really map it out midway through, mm -hmm. you know, because it's, it's, it's kind of more like documentary photography, I guess, you know, it's like, a, it's like shooting a documentary. So you don't really necessarily know exactly what, it's going to be like so yeah. i shoot depending on the project but i shoot for a little while a month six months you know depending on how long the project is and kind of get a feel for like how it's how it's looking how the footage is looking what direction it's going and then i try to then i even shoot a bunch of stuff and i look at you know what i've shot and what i'm really liking you know and then i try to start thinking about things that i can try and things I want to keep doing, you know? So yeah, it's usually midway through that I start really trying to map that out. But I do, I do really, with most projects, I actually do make a conscious effort to really try to develop a visual approach for it at some point. Yeah, definitely. And also it's been interesting to see, like, I mean, obviously like uh, videography and everything, this, the technology of it has changed a lot since you've gotten into it and everybody, and you're seeing now more and more of these days, people starting to utilize like drones, you'll see sliders, like jib arms, all types of different technology. I guess like what's your approach to like camera movement and using some of those technologies within your films? Like how do you kind of view all those different technologies that you can kind of utilize now, I guess? I mean, I've used, I have used all of those. Yeah. I tend to almost never use any of them. Mm -hmm. And that's not because I don't like them or I don't advocate them. I just feel like unless it's used for me personally, unless it's used in the right uh, circumstance, it's distracting to me, you know? So I really, I, I gravitate naturally just because of my, I guess my background or whatever to just more um, straightforward kind of almost documentary style stuff, you know? Like I really love a locked off frame. I would rather shoot like a really strong locked off frame mm -hmm. than like a drone or super dynamic, like ultra modern camera movement, you know, that's, that's me personally. That's just kind of, that's just my personal taste, you know? So, yeah. um, yeah, I don't, and it's, and it's, you know, with, with skateboarding, especially, you know, a lot of that requires a lot of setup time and, people have to wait. And, you know, I kind of, I, I'd rather, like, when I'm on a skate shoot, I'm pretty much always shooting, you know, like, from the moment we get there, I'm usually shooting stills. And then when I feel like it's time to maybe shoot motion, I start shooting motion stuff, whether it's just portraits or little kind of cutaways. Like, I try to always shoot. So usually by the time it's time to actually shoot the trick, I'm getting ready prior to that, but then I jump right into that. So I don't really the way I work doesn't really allow for like having a drone to go up or no, I, shooting on a jib arm or whatever. Yeah, you know? definitely. No, it's really interesting. Yeah, because the thing I really enjoy about your work is like when you look at your still photography, like, you know, you, you published a book with your the photos you, you shot with Jason Dill over the years and this all the still photography you do it all kind of blends together like with your videos and like when I'm looking at the B-roll, it's all one thing. And like one thing I'm always curious about, like any photographer or videographer or what have you, did it kind of take you a while to kind of find your voice as an artist and like finding like what your approach was, I guess? Uh, not really. I think, you know, if anything, it took, I was pretty lucky that I started shooting 
you know, I, I got really into photography first mm -hmm. and then that got me into shooting Super 8, which got me into shooting 16. And it wasn't until really I started shooting 16 and started to think of actually like cinematography that I started to look at it as something other than just kind of purely something I was doing for fun. Mm -hmm. So by that, by then I had already been shooting a lot and skidding a lot of my footage back and really like being excited about certain things or less excited about other things and kind of already like, I think without being as conscious of it, like developing a, a style or whatever you want to call it, you know, because I was really getting into certain types of things. So if anything, it took, you know, my, the first couple skate films I made where I was really like had an audience, I guess, mm -hmm. to feel confident that that actually was like the right thing to do, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Like to feel really confident about what I naturally liked, you know, yeah, and, not, and not feeling like I had to try to try to shoot and have ha, try to shoot in a different way or like somebody else, you know. Definitely. And, and when you're working on your like non skate, like commercial projects or what have you, do you feel like it's important to have like a like a cohesive look to your work? Like when you're working on like non skate stuff or, or do, you, do you feel like you still have the freedom as an artist to like explore or whatnot, I guess? Yeah, you know, it's I mean, as far as like cinematography, it's a weird thing and I haven't really figured it out yet. You know, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I work as a director, but then I always end up DPing everything I direct usually like doing the cinematography which is actually really challenging and sometimes I, I don't want to do that because it's almost too much to do to where I can't really feel like execute everything in a way that I, I feel like everything's kind of compromised you know yeah um but I don't really you know I don't know I guess I look at the project and just try to think about how visually I can make it really strong and maybe like strike a chord I think about that way before I think about like a cohesive kind of look between projects. I mean, I've been doing it for a long time and I don't know if it comes from skateboarding or whatever. And I, and I do try new things, you know, it's like, I do purposely, I do want to try new things. I do want to grow mm -hmm. and I don't want my work to always look the same, but at the same time, the reality of it with commercial projects and bigger productions is you have to move pretty fast and you're relying on your instincts. So um, a lot of times I don't really have much choice to even think about it. You know, yeah. you can pre-plan all this stuff and you have millions of calls and, you know, a visual, visual, uh, like mood board treatments and mood yeah. boards and everything. But when you get out there, it's just like, you just have to do it, you know? Yeah. And a lot of times you have to kind of look at something and quickly think like, that's not working. I'm just going to do what feels right. Yeah. And sometimes it's, it's a miss you know, but I'd say more times than not, when you're editing, you're like, yeah, that was the right choice to make, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think it just all ends up kind of sometimes, at least for me, having a similar feel just because of that. You have to kind of work pretty quickly and rely on your instincts. Definitely. I had it happen to me yesterday. I was shooting this little editorial uh, portrait thing and it was like with COVID, they still want to shoot everything outdoors just for safety. And it was mm -hmm. like 27 degrees out windy it was like 20 mile an hour winds or something and in my mind i was like going into it, i was like yeah i'm gonna shoot it this way i'm gonna like set up a little seamless i'm gonna have a little light i'm gonna shoot the portraits like this but then it just went to, it just went to shit because it was this you couldn't do it because it was just too windy so i had to go to the plan b plan c plan d and just roll with it you know yeah yeah, yeah. it's 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 hard when there's and it's really hard when there's pressure you yeah know? <laughs> you just you ha i mean that's just where you have to just kind of I guess you're winging it, you know, but hopefully yeah. you're winging it in a way that that works and you have to go with your gut. Yeah, definitely. And another interesting part of uh, your new uh, project is that a lot of it was scored by uh, uh, Reverend Barron, um, a.k.a. Danny Garcia, legendary <laughs> skater in his own right. Just such a stylish dude. Um, what was kind of the, the decision to kind of work with him and um, use some of his music? Uh, well, I've used his music before, never for a skate video, mm. uh, really, but I've used his music for a couple of things before, you know, like back in the day uh, when I was working for DC, actually, we, yeah, DC, we went on some kind of, he went on, I went on some trips with Danny and I was skating with Danny around that time. We got to be friends and I've always kept in touch with him and I've always been a big fan of his music, so um when this project came around you know 
a lot of it early on. I didn't initially think of Danny right away, but once we started looking at the realities of this project and our budget and kind of what it consisted of, I thought, you know, we should probably have someone score some music because it's kind of boring, I think, to the audience. But when you, you, when you license music, you license a mainstream song, you can usually only use it in the video and you can't use it for like trailers and for paid, for paid, you know, if you want to push it for, I don't know how to explain that. Like but, Instagram or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, I started thinking like, how can we kind of, you know, maybe we should have someone score this. If we had, if we had, if we scored a little bit, then we could kind of do so much more, you know, and instead of being limited to these kind of like major songs, which personally I'm getting kind of tired of, you know, it's like, it's awesome to have the budget at times to use these kind of major songs, but at the mm -hmm. same time, usually the, the artist never sees it and you're just dealing with a lawyer and everyone just wants to get paid the same as everyone else. It's called most favored nations. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's great to get those songs in there, but it's not as rewarding as when you can work with an artist or a band who's really excited about the project, you know, yeah. scoring for skateboarding is really hard. I've sort of had, off and on I've had sort of hot and cold experience experiences with people scoring music for skate stuff because skating has such a specific feel you know that if the music isn't right it's 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 hard it doesn't really hit hit in the same way so um long story short like right when I thought of Danny I was like you know this could actually be perfect and Danny's one of those guys he's always recording so when I hit him up right away he sent me a Dropbox link with like 15 songs. Wow. And one of the songs is the song that was in the trailer and it's also in the credits, Be Uno. Yep. And uh, I just love that song. And I started cutting stuff to that song and we sort of built out from that. Yeah, I think that's the coolest thing about skate vid videos. That's like how I've learned about so much music. Like I was gonna, I was gonna say one of your first videos you did with Transworld, I believe, was IE, and one of my favorite songs of all time was in that video. It's in the 16 millimeter montage. It was uh, Sunny Day Real Estate, uh, Tearing in My Heart. It was just such a great song. But yeah, that's I think that's just such a cool aspect of uh, of skate videos and being able to use you know music that maybe someone hasn't heard before is just an extra added element instead of using like a known person like you said you know it's i think yeah i think and there's a heritage to that you know of like i grew up in the 80s where you know skate videos used all at the time it was all like hardcore and sort of i guess independent you know music skate rock and stuff at the time you know mm -hmm. like um you know fire hose and uh, Black Flag and all these bands that when I was 13, I'd never heard of, you yeah. know, and that turned me on to so much music. And I feel like that's all it's always been that way through Plan B videos and then through Zero videos and through whatever else, you know. So um, I think like the soundtrack to skate videos is it, it's, it is really important because it turn, it really does turn people on to music, you know, so um yeah, it's it's I think it's it's pretty key. And I think you know, going back to Danny, I think I don't know. I I just think it's cool to use it was it was awesome. I think his music was great and I think it was really cool to use like a skater's score, you know, to use Danny Garcia having him score the film, I thought was was pretty awesome. Yeah, and definitely anybody wants to listen to it, I know it's on Spotify. I found it on there the other night and it's probably on like most of the other other platforms. You can stream it and all this stuff's there. It's really amazing. Yeah. And, um, I guess to go back, man, I was just kind of curious, like where you grew up and like, how do you kind of get into like skateboarding and photography and like what kind of came first for you, I guess? Uh, yeah, I grew up in Michigan. I was actually born uh, outside of Boston, uh, then moved to Indiana for a hot minute. And then I, I grew up in Michigan, Ann Arbor, and uh, which is a really, really awesome town to grow up in, uh, especially at the time, probably still now. Did you did and, you know uh, Blayback as a kid? Because I know he grew up out there too. I didn't. No. Um, you know, we had some mutual friends, and I'm sure we crossed paths. Yeah. He's from Lansing, mm -hmm. um, which is not. It's probably two hours away from Ann Arbor. You know. So, no. But we we ended up being roommates in San Francisco, and you know, like later on, and that's sort of how we became friends, which is funny. Yeah. Right, right when he was starting out. Um, but. Um, 
Yeah, so I grew up in Ann Arbor, started skating when I was 12 or 13. Um, you know, I actually had, I went to a really amazing high school. It was a progressive alter, um, public high school, alternative high school community. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a photo class there and I wasn't, you know, at the time I was just not, school was not my thing in my, you know, it wasn't my prime priority. You know, I was just obsessed with skating. Basically, yeah. it's all I cared about. I yeah. Think. Um, which I think a lot of things suffered at the time because I was so just kind of tunnel vision skateboarding. But um, I did have a photo class and I just didn't. I remember it's just funny. I just didn't take it seriously. I remember printing. I remember doing everything where you would like put the you'd find stuff and you'd put it on the paper and then you'd expose it and it would make the sort of silhouette of whatever it was. I remember oh, yeah, yeah like the beginner, like when you first learn about, you know, printing in the dark room. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I didn't really take it that seriously. I don't even remember how I did. I don't think I have any of the photos from that time. And I then moved to San Francisco when I was 18. I got, you know, sponsored, moved to San Francisco. Um, eventually, you know, that's all I did was I was like a sponsored skater, then a pro skater. And it was being around skaters and a lot of creative people especially Gabe Morford um who I became who I was friends with and I became roommates with and who gave me a camera that's what got me into photography so and and even when he gave me a camera at the time I was starting to draw a lot and paint and you know I was, was into a lot of different creative stuff but uh Gabe gave me a camera and I shot a couple rolls and I gave him the roles. I don't remember how it happened, but I remember specifically when he, I was at Huff's house, actually Huff's apartment. And Gabe came probably there to meet us. And he came from the lab and he's like, hey, these are yours. You know, and he just gave me two um, contact sheets, of, you know, contact sheets of two, two exposed roles. And uh, I just remember looking at the photos, looking at the contact sheets, and I could not believe I took those photos. Wow. And that's not because I'm saying there were great photos or I felt like I was a great photographer. It's just that's when it clicked for me, you know, the magic of like seeing the pictures. You know, it was a old Minolta with a 50, mil, 50 millimeter lens. It was a Minolta X700, I think, with a 51.2 lens. Yeah. So it was like a lot of it was like this 50 millimeter lens wide open, you know. So even looking at the contact sheets, I could tell, you know, like I could see the depth of field and I could kind of see these things that were happening in the photos. And uh, I was like, that's what hooked me right there. You what know, kind that, of stuff were you shooting? Was Were you shooting like obviously Gabe Morford, legendary skateboard photography. Um, but what kind of stuff were you kind of shooting when you first kind of got into it? Just my friends and people on the street and tour. Like, you know, I went on a tour and that was 95 and I went on a tour that summer. And very soon after that, I went on a like a five week trip. And I think I would sort of like pilfer film off Gabe as the trip went on. I shot maybe like 10 or 12 rolls. Damn. And I was just shooting, uh, you know, it's funny. I wasn't shooting demos. I wasn't shooting skating. I was really shooting like all of, I was shooting my friends in the hotel, hotels, outside the motels, in the van, uh, just, you know, just real, you know, just kind of, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't thinking of it consciously, but I was definitely shooting a very like documentary style, you know, all black and white. Um, yeah. And then when we got back, I got those roles back. And um, that's when I really, we, that's when we built the dark room. We moved in. I think that's probably around when we got an apartment together and we built a dark room. And then I was like shooting, I was bulk loading film. I was, you know, developing my own film. I was printing almost every night down. And we had this little dark room down in the basement of this apartment building we lived on on Bush Street downtown and um, printing all the time. I was like obsessed. You know, I did it as much, if not probably more than I was skating. I was just like really, really uh, into photography. So were you like looking at any other photographers or kind of researching this kind of the history of photography at all? Or are you just kind of focused on this kind of doing your own thing at that point? I kind of, I was getting, I was definitely getting into it. I remember a, right around that time, sort of 
serendipitously found this Annie Leibovitz book on the street when I was skating. It was in like a paper bag laying on the side. Damn, sidewalk. that's a come up, man. <laughs> it was the it was the classic like it's a soft cover. It just says Annie Leibovitz, and it's sort of a it's just you know like probably thirty years of her photos. It's got mm-hmm. like those amazing pictures like when she went on tour with the Rolling Stones. Yep. Like all that stuff, and I was like really into that and i lived with gabe you know i remember gabe had uh robert frank lines of my hand yep I remember spending a lot of time looking at that book so yeah i started to get pretty into it you know back then i'd go to bookstores you know i'd go to city lights or i go to even borders there was a borders close to where we live and i just go into the photo book section and just look at books mm-hmm. you know if it was a rainy day or whatever so yeah yeah that's interesting and like did you ever have any interest in uh, shooting actual, cause like looking at your work, like you said, a lot of it's just kind of documentary, your friends hang out in hotels and it's kind of your day to day life type of stuff. Did you ever have any interest in like shooting the action of skateboarding or that you kind of this more focused your like videography and cinematography on that aspect, I guess. Yeah, no, I was never shooting the skating and I was never really that inspired to shoot skate photos for whatever reason, probably because I was a skater and there's other people that did it well, mm-hmm. you know, um, I was definitely, I think, even prior to me shooting photos, I think I was really inspired by some of the skate photographers um, that had had pictures when I was younger, specifically, I think, Tobin Yelland. Yep. You know, like his portraits stood out so much, you know, and, and as a kid, I wasn't like I was like, wow, that's an incredible photograph or look at that portrait. It was more that it was this sort of like moment in this feeling that you weren't seeing anywhere else in the magazines you know yeah it's like this kind of very candid and then very almost like you know there there really was like an art there you know and and i think as a kid i wasn't conscious of it but you know tobin's photos uh some of spike's pictures i mean there's a lot of people stirred but tobin's photos for sure there's like a mood there and there's like an intimacy i guess in those photos where you really kind of saw you cap it captured a different side of of the people that you didn't always see and i think it wasn't until i was like pretty heavy into shooting photos years later that i realized how much those pictures tobin shot uh influenced me you know that i think that i realized like almost that i was kind of not copying uh tobin at all because i don't think i was even aware of it but i realized like well i think i'm actually trying to kind of like capture the exact same mood and I think I'm trying to like, in a way, I'm always like reaching to kind of find those moments when I'm shooting, I think, because those pictures were so had such an impact on me, yeah. you know, and I think that's similar with a lot of creative influences, but those photos of Tobin, for sure. So when I started shooting, it was way less, I, I almost never shot any action. I don't think I shot any, it was really like, just people and friends and, you know, kind of candid moments is what I was kind of interested in capturing. Yeah. I was going to ask you about one photo because before I, uh, we did this interview, I talked to Ryan Allen, who I know you're friends with, and he, mm-hmm. to- he told me to ask you. I'll pull it up on the screen so you can see it and people can check it out on YouTube when I post it. But Ryan Allen said he was always just very curious about this photo and like what the, <laughs> what the back. He, he actually asked me, he's like, was this set up or what was going on in this picture? Definitely not set up. I'll tell you that is at the... Um... Travel Lodge in San Francisco on the corner of Valencia and Market. It's sort of this notorious travel lodge, right? That yeah, I've, I've stayed there back in the okay. day. Yeah, I've stayed there many times, <laughs> and it's kind of like dodgy. It was always cheap. It was a good location, so you'd always stay there. So that was at our travel lodge. You know, that was I think probably I don't remember if it was the beginning or the end of the day, but it was just one of those days where, for whatever reason, I think we were waiting to go somewhere. You know, I mean, Jake's got his backpack on. So I think we're probably getting ready to leave to go somewhere. But, uh, you know, around this, I mean, I guess always I'm shooting, but around this time, especially, I was like really shooting. I always had my camera on me, you know. Mm -hmm. So for what there's really not much of a story to it. I mean, we were just sitting there and I saw it. I think I maybe have three frames from this this moment, you know. Yeah. But I mean, this one, just like that look on Jake's face. And I, I just love that. This isn't really the best uh, 
rendi- I mean, this is fine, but like, yep. if you pr- if you print it differently, that shaft of light in between them is really cool. If I if you like, yeah. bring that up a bit. That's one thing I always really love about this photo. But yeah, yeah there's. It is interesting because it's like that's the cool thing about photography. Like you're the only person who's there, so everyone can take their like when they when I look at it or someone else looks at it, you kind of build this whole narrative in your mind. Because like when I look at this, I'm like, damn, did like did Jake do something to piss Ava off or something? Because he's got this weird like scowl on his face. It's just really, yeah. you know. Yeah, no, I mean, I I uh, I love that photo just because for me it looks like. Um, um, I don't know. It looks like a Jake to me. It looks like a it looks like a photo from a just the look just his face reminds me of a photo from a different era or something you know yeah um i don't know yeah, yeah no it was interesting and uh so you're like a pro skateboarder and an sf and like how do you kind of make that transition to like was there a point you're like hey you know what like now i want to pursue this uh, like photography and directing and making films or like how did that kind of all happen for you yeah i mean i was skating and kind of getting less I don't know how to explain it but I was sort of feeling less inspired to not really skate but just about what I was doing in skating and uh, at the same time I was getting really into really into cinematography like really really into cinematography so at the time I thought you know maybe I'll just not skate as a pro skater and kind of really go for uh, cinematography you know and this is when skating was a lot different, you know, like, um, I just think I wasn't really happy with what I was doing with, um, in skating, you know, and, and it didn't, it didn't seem like that crazy of a move to me. So I, I, I um, so I, can you hear those dings? Should I yeah. turn my phone off? Yeah. You what, yeah, yeah. You can hear it. Let me just turn it to silent. No problem. Happens to me too. Um, um, okay. So, uh, um, yeah, so I wasn't really like super excited about what was going on with skating with me. So, and I was really actually a lot more excited about um, pursuing cinematography. So, uh, I I quit being a pro and not really on bad terms or anything. I just kind of stopped doing it and I went full on into cinematography. I uh, bought a Bolex, and the guy that I bought the Bolex from was a wildlife filmmaker and. Wow. He asked me if I could load an Air ESR and I lied and said I could, <laughs> you know, and a week later I went that's, with him. That's the key to the creative business. You get a call for a job. It's like, yeah, I can do that. And then hang up and be like, all right, let's, how am I going to figure this shit out? <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. And then a week later I was in Alaska working as an, uh, basically a camera loader. Hold on a second, dude. I don't know. How do I turn this off? Yeah. So I was, uh, so I, I ended up in Alaska uh, a week later. I was in Alaska with him and um, working as a assistant camera, basically a loader with with the uh, an Air ESRs on a uh, loading film and taking notes on a, a film about uh, coastal brown bears in Alaska. And I came back <clears throat> and I was kind of started doing a little bit of that. Dude, hold on a second. I don't know how to turn this off. Yeah. How do I turn it off? Yeah, it's weird. I think it, I turned all, it off. Yeah, that's the it's only. Like, I think it's because you have it set up, connected through your cell phone or something. It's weird. It's happened to me before. I uh, mean, I have my cell phone set to silent. Let me turn it to uh, my cell phone to airplane mode. Oh, you yeah. know what I need to do? Sorry, I think I need to do my cell phone to do not do not disturb. Yeah, try that. Um, notifications. No, sorry, man. No, it's all um, good, dude. Don't. Cellular. <laughs> um, it's do happening. Not disturb. Do not disturb. <laughs> okay, I think this should work. So. All right. It's um, cool. um. Yeah, we were just talking about like, yeah. So you're kind of this getting into cinematography. So at that point, did did you think you were even interested in making skate films, or you're kind of thinking more outside the box? It's kind of making movies and different projects like that. It kind of sounds like work on the wildlife stuff. Yeah, I, as soon as I came back from that trip in Alaska, I was basically, you know, back then I would just, I think I even put my card or like a notice up on a, like a an SF on like a, what do you call it? Like a, pe- a pegboard or whatever. A corkboard, a yeah, pegboard cork, or whatever. Yeah. 
<laughs> was like, hey, I'm down to like help. And like I started like working, you know, most of the time I wasn't paid. Um, uh, I worked as a um, as an intern on um, uh, at this post production studio. I don't know if it's still there called Outpost, basically mm -hmm. like answering the phone and making coffee, which just sounds so ridiculous. But you know, like Werner Herzog was cutting a film there and I met Holy Werner shit. Herzog. So, That's crazy. Uh, stuff like that. Um, let me just real quick, let me re respond to uh, my lady. She's like, yeah, uh, man, do your thing. You know how it is. She's out like Christmas shopping. She needs to know about something. <laughs> it's all good, man. I appreciate your time, man. Yeah. This is great. All right. Yeah. See, this is still, I don't, let me quit messages again, but it's still, um, so yeah, that so you know I was doing whatever I could, and I was really trying just to learn. I was like, you know, you kind of just like anything else, you just put yourself out there, and you meet people. And if you're really, I think, hungry, and you show up on time, and people like being around you, mm -hmm. uh, then they kind of refer you to someone else, you know. So <clears throat> I was doing a lot of that, and then at the same time. I saw a trans world video. I saw six cents mm -hmm. and it had some really amazing 16 in it. And I just cold called trans world, which just seems so random, but asking if, Ty, if I could leave a message for Ty Evans. And I left a message for Ty um, saying that I really wanted to shoot some 16, if he'd be into that for his next video. And then Ty called me back and uh, was super into it. And like, the next day or two days later, I had a FedEx box full of 100 foot rolls of 16. Wow, that's crazy. That, this one phone call and there you go. You're on the track, man. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, like I was, you know, he knew like I had already shot and he probably knew enough to know that I was like a photographer, I guess, to a degree. And Yeah, it's true. I lived in SF and, you know, so I started basically then like going out with a couple different photographers you know, just shooting 16, which is so at the time must have just seemed so random, like because I was a pro skater a couple of years before. And then I'm kind of out uh, just tagging along shooting 16. But I was like really taking it seriously. I was taking notes on everything I shot. You know, yeah. so it would be like, can you read backside nose grind pop out 75 millimeter lens shot at you know, one, four, two, eight split at. 36 frames a second using this ND filter. I really took it seriously because I wouldn't even see the film for six months. Yeah. And, and I knew that I would probably totally forget what I was doing. So, yeah, I always um, thought it was amazing because, like, like, like shooting 16 with skateboarding, as you know, it like it takes a long time for these guys to land some of these tricks. So that was always some of my my, my favorite parts in the transfer videos. A lot of times was like the montages with the, the 16. I, I loved it. It just had like a there's like a feeling to it. It, it, it. You get with film that's just not the same as with digital, I think, you know? It, it's true. And uh, it, it's really true. And, you know, that that was something I could do that I used as a way to kind of just shoot film and learn, mm -hmm. you know, and also make a little money and kind of be around skaters. And that kind of then just eventually grew every video. I was doing more and more until Ty, um, called me one day and say, said that he was quitting trans world to work for girl and they needed someone to kind of work with him, work with John Holland to take his place down at trans world. And he asked me if I wanted to do it. And I was, said I would do it. I had absolutely no experience in it, but that's kind of, that's what brought me down to LA and eventually to doing what I'm doing now. Do you remember that being like a pretty daunting task back then? Cause like at that point you, it seems like you're kind of just shooting 16, eight, eight millimeter, this type of stuff. But then you got to start shooting video and editing. Like, what do you remember about those like early <laughs> days of like, all right, now I, I got to make this work. <laughs> I mean, I have two memories. Uh, one is uh, one of the first times shooting on DV. So I'd never shot skating on DV. So I think Ty sent me a VX 1000 and a fisheye. A Transworld had an extra one. And I went to go try to film a line of somebody at Pier 7. I don't remember who it was, but this sounds so insane. <laughs> but I was filming the line and on one of the first few tries, I needed to slow down and I had never 
filmed a line. So I didn't have this sort of instinct to drag my foot, you know? So I dragged my hand. Oh my God. <laughs> Which is just like, that's how uh, out of it I was, you know? Not out of it, just I'd never even tried to shoot skating or film a line before. So there was the, that, that was definitely the learning curve. And then, you know, once I, was about to get the job i i you know i flew down there to meet ty and john in person and we went to transworld and ty was editing uh modus operandi and um he was editing carol's part and this is a testament to how cool ty is you know like they were basically living in the office editing that video which at the time was a really gnarly you know really it's one of the best videos i mean it's such a good video and it was a mike carroll part and he was editing Carol's intro and he's like, you know, hey, Hunt, like, I'm going to go get some food. Do you want to just work on this for a little bit? I had never edited anything. I had no computer. I was completely computer Ill illiterate. I was watching what he was doing. Yeah. But I was like, OK, cool. And I was literally at the time I didn't I was so afraid that I was, gonna, you know, that I was going to delete everything or somehow ruin it, you know? Yeah, seriously. And um, it's only Mike Carroll's transfer part. No pressure. <laughs> yeah. And also just, I don't know, try to, if you can think, if you can put yourself in my mind, like I had no, I was completely computer illiterate. So I didn't really understand that he could probably, that he had like saved edits or whatever it might be, you know? So I was really sort of on edge and I started editing his part. There's like a little bit of that part where he like, it's talking about the wind and he like hits something and falls forward. That's the very first thing I ever edited and I remember at one point, I don't know what I did, but the whole timeline started racing forward, mm -hmm. like like 10 times speed. Like I didn't know what I, I pressed the, a button or something. And I was like, holy shit. And I like I, I got back to Mike's part and I worked on it. And it's probably only 10 seconds of his intro, five or 10 seconds of his intro. But like I said, a testament to how cool Ty, Ty is, is that he not only was fine with me just sitting down and working on it, yeah he never changed that wow he never changed what i cut so the very first thing i ever cut was in carol's intro and it's still there he never he didn't touch it you know and i didn't really realize that till later until i really started making doing the videos myself like how cool that was for him just to like let me work on it and then just to just to leave it and to move on you know? yeah that's awesome and it's like the editing process is that something you enjoy and no. no, you don't like it. <laughs> and no. and then with like, because like obviously you do other commercial non-skate stuff on those projects. Are you handling the editing generally yourself or does it usually get passed off to like some editing like a uh, company or something like that? It does sometimes. It depends on the project. If it's something that I'm sort of personally invested in, I like to edit it myself, you know, or if it's something where there's subject matter that I'm really familiar with and it's more nuanced or whatever. I like to edit myself. If it's kind of a straight commercial job where it's just, you know, um, a storyboard and they want it close to that or whatever. And I'm not really like creatively as invested in it. Then yeah, the, like it's, it's having an editor there is amazing because usually those, those jobs, they need to turn them around really quickly also, but I usually edit. I mean, it's my least favorite part of the process just because it's just, it's constant problem solving. That's what editing is. It's yeah. just, prob you know, you're like finding music, trying to find music. Okay, you find the music, trying to find a story arc and whatever it might be, getting the footage in there, trying to figure out why this isn't working. There's no sometimes any tangible reason why something isn't working. You just have to keep like massaging it and keep trying new things mm -hmm. until finally you're like, that works, you know? Or you might watch something a hundred times and be like, I'm just, this does not, does not feel like it's working to me. And you just have to kind of keep going at it until you figure out what it is that's not right and you make it work. So it's not that I like hate it. It's just pretty, you know, it's kind of lonely, you know, usually you're by yourself yeah, and it's just sitting in front of a computer and it's pretty draining, you know, like eight to 10 hours of editing is really draining because like it's pro it's problem solving, you know, so yeah, it's it's probably and it's very you never feel like you're done, you know, like you get it done and then you look at it and you're like, oh, I got to fix the sound right there or like, oh, I forgot to the color on that. It's the wrong shot or whatever it might be. It's like it's this sort of, um, you know, 
it, it's uh, like rarely do I ever feel like something's completely done when I finish it. You know, it's normally like, fuck, it's, we got it. We got to deliver it now. Okay. And then you send it out. That's just how it always seems to be. So it's sort of a, you know, it's, it makes me, that's why lately I've been trying to do more books. Yeah. Because it's a really nice balance. It's like totally the opposite. I'm not saying that making books is easy. It's not. That's also really kind of labor intensive and a pain in the ass at times, but it's so different. And it's just such, I can listen to music, you know, it's like, you can't listen to music when you're editing usually. Cause yeah, that music. is true. That's yeah, that is, that is, a, it is fun. Yeah. Editing photos and listening to music or like a podcast and like, oh, it's the ed- best and editing audio in video is like, it's a nightmare. Sometimes it's uh, that's like a good audio is like the hardest thing, man. Um, yeah. And speaking on books, I know you just, I think re-released it. It was published originally in 2018 um your book uh 96 dreams 2000 memories um what was kind of your goal with that book and how did it kind of all come together i guess uh that book was um something that was never intended to be a book you know i just basically from when i really got into starting shoot shooting photos again there was a little bit of a lull in the late 90s and then once i moved down to la and started making the skate videos i was pretty consumed with that so i wasn't really shooting many photos and once I got kind of comfortable, um, I got a Leica, and, um, which I still have, an M6, and I was just like started shooting all the time. So around that time, I started hanging out with Dill again, Jason Dill, and yeah. I just started shooting Dill a lot. You know, Dill is like kind of the perfect photo subject because he never does the same thing twice, never looks the same on any two days. Yep. He's incredibly photogenic and he also really understands what makes a good photo and and well i guess more so he has a real appreciation for photography so he knows what you're doing you know yeah. if that makes sense you yeah. know like it's not like he's faking it i don't shoot like really like staged photos at all mm-hmm. but he knows he knows what i'm doing when i'm shooting him and he appreciates that versus other people might just kind of act different because the camera's there or they might not be conscious of it. And just if there's a good moment, they might get up and leave or purposely do something stupid to ruin it or whatever. Just oh yeah. They go. That <laughs> makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Like <laughs> Dill, Dill has an appreciation. So, you know, and I talk about it a little bit in the intro of the book, you know, I think looking back at the time, you know, in 2000, 2001, when I started shooting Jason, I had pretty, pretty recently been a pro skater. And I think part of it and part of, why I, was, why I was shooting Jason and a lot of other people that I was working with is I was also sort of fascinated with this sort of type of life that I had sort of had, you know, but then had walked, walked away from, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so I think I was just really interested in kind of just documenting, you know, pro, pro skaters. That doesn't really sound right, but I mean, just documenting my friends and their lives and, um, Jason kind of just being the one who I shot the most. So, you know, I spent a lot of time with Jason in, in, you know, in spurts, like, you know, over about 15 years. And, um, you know, in 2017, I was thinking, I I reached out to Jason saying, hey, we should do something, man. I have so many photos of you over the years. We should do like a, something for a magazine or something. And pretty quickly, I think we were like, let's actually maybe do a book. You know, oh wow like like there's too much I, I think i started digging in more and i was like i think it could actually be a book so that's kind of where it came from and then i spent some time with him that year knowing that it's a book kind of shooting him so there's sort of a you know some more recent more recent imagery um because you know a lot had changed for dill since i had kind of really shot him a lot prior which had been about four or five years prior to that so um that's how it happened, you know, and I just, I basically made the book. I learned InDesign and I basically completely made the book. I had everything drum scanned. It's like, the Damn, so you, you designed the whole cover and everything yourself. Yeah. Both, both books. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's badass. Yeah. That's some real skateboard shit, man. Just do it yourself, <laughs> man. I respect it. I didn't realize that. That's awesome. Yeah. It was, it was a learning experience, you know, like I went to the Par- paradigm which is a publisher out of New York who had done a love park book that was really beautiful. And, um, who, one of the partners at the time paradigm, uh, Jonathan, uh, made this book. It's called love and it's really beautiful printed in Germany, like 
hardbound, just really a beautiful book. And I was like, this is what I want to do. You know, like Jason and I were like, I don't want to make a book that's like a skating book that's sponsored by someone or whatever. Like we were like, we want to actually make a photo, a proper photo book, you know, and going through Paradigm, they're small enough and they had a little bit of a connection with skating where I think they understood that, um, you know, I, I, I didn't want to change it. Like I didn't want to like kind of go to a publisher and have someone kind of edit it way down or something. I just wanted to, by that time, the book was pretty much done. I wanted to get it out. So they were the perfect partner for that. Um, and then, but it was, a, but, it, but it, like I was real quickly, I was going to say like, you said some skateboard shit for sure. Like I ended up, we went out to Germany to print it and I realized like, I don't know what I'm doing, you know, <laughs> like, How they, so? you know, the paradigm guys knew to a degree, but I just had never been on press before for a book. You know, yeah. I didn't know how to like communicate with the printer about, you know, taking a little bit of magenta out or whatever it might be. Um, and I think there's some steps prior to that, that I, there's some um, steps prior to that, that um, I didn't take to really get like the best to, to get the images exactly how I wanted them, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, it was a learning process. And then, uh, yeah, so it's, that's, that's sort of how the book first came around a couple of years ago. And I know it's now it's available again. I think it's like a pre-order right now. You have the link on your Instagram. People can go order it. Um, with the new edition, is there anything you switched up in terms of like the design or the photos in it? Or is it this kind of the same design as the first time, I guess? Uh, it's, Similar. I mean, it's it's a sec. It's a you know, it's a new edition. It's through Super Labo. It's a Japanese edition. Um, so it's you know a little bit different on the inside. A bit. It feels much, very much like the same book. Yeah. It's it's less pages, but I always tell people it's I think a tighter edit. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the cover is quite a bit different. Um, the printing is obviously quite a bit different. You know, like Jason and I had always talked about. You know, let's just do one book and if we ever do a second edition of this book it should be japanese a japanese edition because we're just both big fans of uh japanese culture and japanese photo books and super labo is like one of my favorite publishers you know um uh they've made some of my favorite books so that was sort of my dream i didn't even think that would ever be something that could happen and once it but it but it did which is just crazy so this is basically yeah it's like a a japanese edition of that book printed by super labo so and you guys um, did a really cool limited like i think it was 200 um um copies it's basically like a it's like a slip case and it's like a fine art type of book that you guys yeah. produced it looked amazing yeah so you know super labo basically is uh yasunori hoki he's like a master bookmaker master bookmaker in japan and, um, you know, it was a just crazy honor just that he, I couldn't even believe that he wanted to do this book in the first place. And once we got to get, start, get once we started to get farther along, he said, hey, I really would like to make a plus plus edition. That's like kind of a nicer edition, a limited amount. I said, that's amazing. And he then he sent me his idea for the design. And, you know, I just said, that's awesome. Do it like I didn't give any input. I didn't want to. I really wanted it to be his thing. So that plus plus edition for me is really special, especially once I saw it in, in person and how beautiful it is. I mean, just the detail of his books and the materials and how both of those books feel in your hand, just the paper and the binding. It's just unbelievable. Um, yeah. And that plus plus edition was all, all uh, Yasunori's design. So um, it's cool. Yeah. And even like the cover of the new one, you know, the original book, I was happy with the cover, um, but I didn't really know how to make book covers. And I think it's great. It's really simple, but I really kind of always wanted to do more. So for this, uh, for this second edition, I really was like, I'm going to kind of go for it on this cover and do something different. And I presented him that idea of, you know, sort of like the film strip on a hardbound with a translucent paper dust jacket with the big portrait of Dill on it. Yeah. And he was super down to do it. I couldn't believe it. And, you know, it's funny because that's actually influenced by that book, Lines of My Hand, that okay. uh, Gabe had, you yeah. know, when I, when I was young. So No, it looked amazing. So, so 
When's the Ave book coming out, man? He, he, I'm sure you got a you got a grip of you got I don't a, know. You got, I don't you got know. a dill, you got a dill book, you gotta give Ave the book too, right? <laughs> I haven't I haven't documented Anthony as intensely. You yeah, would yeah. Think that maybe you would think that maybe I I, I would, but yeah, but I haven't. I mean I have probably the equivalent amount of Anthony for sure. Mm-hmm. But you know, Jason like I'd go stay at Jason's house in New York, you know, and just shoot just him hanging out with his girlfriend and him just out on the street, you know, and uh, I don't really shoot Anthony like that, you know, just because, yep. you know, I mean, Anthony, I don't think I'm not going to go stay at Anthony's house. He's Anthony, you know, it's like everyone's he's, he's a lot more private in that way. You know, Dill's a lot more open. So, yeah, no, that makes sense. Everyone's just different personalities in your relationship with everyone is different. A um, couple more questions. I'll let you go. For sure. Um, you know, I was really excited to talk to you about um, you ended up going to work for DC and made an incredible video, which was this like the stuff in there was this insane on on all, all fronts with everybody in that video. Stevie and obviously Danny Way with the mega ramp. Um, but how do you kind of become involved with DC and what was kind of your experience getting to work on that like project? Um. Yeah, so I was at Transworld. I made a few videos, and then somehow I be- I got to uh, became friends with Joe Castrusi, who you know helped who made photosynthesis and started Habitat, and he's just a really rad dude. And Joe actually was going to make the D- he was going to work for DC to make the DC video. And then Joe, I think it was a little bit overwhelming because somehow he was thinking he could make the DC video and run Habitat at the same time. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I don't even know how what he was thinking. So he then asked if I wanted to make the DC video or what, what was to be the DC video with him. And I was super down for that just because I love Joe and I really respect Joe. And then pretty soon into it, he's like, I can't do this. I'm going to bail. Are yeah. you cool with doing it? Are you cool with doing it by yourself? <laughs> and I it really freaked me out. But um, I had gotten to know Ken Block, who at the time DC was still his company, him and him and Damon Way's company, and uh, like still to this day is the best person, one of the best people I've ever worked with, and uh, the best boss I've ever had. I mean, he was just like super hands on, but in the coolest possible way, and the most supportive way. So I really liked Ken and Ken, I think by that time felt enough confidence in me. I think that he just had me doing it solo. And that's kind of how, that's kind of how it happened. You know, at the time I really, I wanted to kind of take my filmmaking further, you know, and DC was huge at the time. Skateboarding was huge at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of money. So like right off the bat, we were, I was like in a helicopter shooting Danny way at night, like on this, I think that ended up being in the DC video, but shooting on 35 and you know like I was able to try all these things um so that was really very important for me to have to have done all that you know and uh I learned so much it was a really positive time like making the DC video then we made the bonus video we made a book that's the first book I've ever made like the the deluxe edition DVD which I pretty much with uh, my friend Curtis who worked there at the time we did that together um really very awesome time but at the same time there wasn't really like as much as much of a personal connection with the work you know and once I was kind of done with all of those projects think thinking about what to do next I was thinking like man actually I really kind of I don't know if I want to to do more DC stuff I think I actually want to try to do something different something that's a bit more personal so that's why I, I, I went over to workshop oh yeah that makes sense and uh what do you remember about going to the going to the, work with Danny Way the first time at that mega ramp? Because I remember when that when I first saw that first picture, I was like, "What the fuck is this thing, man? It, it was just insane." I mean, I, I will never forget. You know, I mean, Danny is like one of the most intense and I think innovative in his own way people I've ever known. You know, because he would always be talking about something that was like so next level. You know. But he's so intense and really intelligent. So he would also know that he'd also be planning on how he could do that. It's not someone that sits around and talks about all these things. He, you're like, if Danny's talking about this, he's probably going to try to do it. Yeah. Because he had already like jumped out of the helicopter, remember? Yep. And he'd already done that like 20 foot high air and that huge kickflip. So it was like already it almost was like, okay, whatever I do, whatever we do with Danny is going to be 
groundbreaking and there's probably no limit to what this guy can do. He had already proven that, you know. So he had been talking about building this ramp, you know, building a bigger ramp where you could go higher. And then I don't, you know, it was towards the end of the video. So I was probably really busy doing all kinds of other stuff, but it was like, I knew that like, okay, they approved this ramp to get done and um, the budget was there and he was building it. And uh, hold on real quick. No What's up, buddy? Are you all right? I had to put a stormtrooper suit on. <laughs> no worries. It's all, it's, all, it's all good. No, I was just saying, um, I will never, you know, so we knew that he was building this ramp and, um, but I hadn't, you know, I will never forget like coming, I was like this little out in the middle of nowhere, this, uh, where he had built it and it was a long drive. And I will never remember this dirt road that went, that, that kind of went up and over a hill. And when you got to the top of this hill, you could actually see this ramp, um, I'll never forget that because I was by myself driving. We're all driving up there for the first time. And I actually started laughing out loud because of how insane this <laughs> ramp looked. I mean, now you see those ramps, so you're kind of used to it. But at the time, There's nothing like I mean, it just looked like a, like the Titan, like, not Titanic, but it just looked like a like a like a like a skyscraper. Well, yeah, I just something. remember like because when they had to dig into the ground, the dirt. So it was so deep that like on the side it was like those dirt things on the side, and then the ramps down the middle, and it was just so massive the scale. Yeah, no, it was uh, sur just surreal, and the fact that Danny was even skating that ramp was surreal, and then everything he did on it, you know, like for that for that first video. We shot all the, everything on the helicopter. And I mean, it's just sort of like just unbelievable that that even went down. Yeah, that know? must have been the hard part. Like filming it is just showing the scale of it because like like this, the composition and like document, it must have been kind of awkward, I guess, just because it's so massive, I guess. Yeah, the that's I think the hardest thing about shooting that ramp or any of those ramps is just showing the scale It's because you have to be almost literally up on a mountain or high up above to see how big it really is and to be able to kind of see everything because there's trees and it's you know built into the hill so i think it's you, i've never been to bob's ramp but i feel like when you watch footage of bob's ramp it's that people have the same problem you can just tell there's not one like big grand yeah like shot of the whole thing you know and that's why we did the helicopter stuff is just we knew that we would have to get up high to really to show people what this ramp really looks like otherwise it would, you'd have to kind of put it together in your brain yeah it was incredible and uh yeah i guess to wrap up greg like uh you've been in been doing this for a while photography and everything with skateboarding and your cinematography i guess like what, what kind of keeps you um with skateboarding and like anything you're kind of hoping to work on moving forward uh, so like you're saying, what keeps me with skateboarding? Yeah. Uh, I think just my friends, you know, I think I'm pretty lucky that I'm, oh, I'm getting older, you know, and the fact that I still have skaters who I can work with and who I connect with, you know, I feel pretty lucky about that. I don't know if it's always going to be that way. So yeah. I feel like I'm trying to take advantage of that while I still can. Who knows? Maybe I'll still be doing it for a long time. I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, you know, skating can be the most frustrating and difficult thing to to have to work with as, you know, doing video work or photo work as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also can be the most rewarding, you know, because just you're with your friends and most of the people that you work with are pretty rad and super funny and just great to be around. And you develop friendships that you have for years, you know, and you still get to work and see these people work with and see these people. So, um, you know, that's what keeps me, keeps me in it, you know, and to be honest, I've got a family too. And just to have like consistent work. Yeah. I feel really fortunate to have that, that I'm just not like out in the freelance world, you know, like everyone else, which I am, but that I have, you know, skateboarding and that kind of community there as something to keep me busy and support yeah. me to a degree. I feel Super, super fortunate about that, just to be where I'm at with Vans, especially. I mean, they're just such good people there and so many of my good friends. So I have the perspective now to really, to really, really appreciate that. So, you know, I do work with Vans um, full time pretty much. So, you know, we have a few projects lined up for next year. Um, 
which I'm pretty excited about. Nothing too specific as of yet, but um, anything with that. anything with Birdman, we gonna get a Birdman part? I would love to. I would love to. Are you That's kidding me? Ins- it is insane. Like I, I keep I follow him on Instagram, man. It is blows my mind on a week day to day basis the stuff that guy does at age fifty two. It is fucking insane. Yeah, it's yeah. I did two things with him this year. You know, it's funny. Like I don't know. I never really knew Tony that well. Like I shot him for, he was in sight unseen. And then I think that's the only time I'd shot him. Yeah. I came to the mega ramp once, but we were never like, um, we were never, t- we were never tight, you know? And uh, we just never were really in the same circles. Yeah. And um, uh, this year, yeah, I did like a little welcome thing for him. We shot at the, at the Vans outdoor park. Mm-hmm. And it was just so rad just to work with him you know he's such yeah. a pro, he's such a pro and he's such a cool dude like i really mean that it's not like he's just nice he's like a really cool dude yeah and then we did this crazy uh when his video game came out we did this like playstation piece and yeah man like he's like ripping you yeah. know like that little thing we did like he was ripping and like it was a lot of skating that day so it's it's inspirational and on top of that it's just like i follow him just like you and so many other people and just to see like his daily it's nuts <laughs> like and then on top of everything that he's doing you know and posting he's like skating all the time you know you see footage of him and he's like really skating good so yeah he's he's super inspirational i'm not i don't you know i'm not sure what he's got planned but i mean i'll work with tony any chance i can get i mean honestly most like like Ave or Andrew Reynolds or Roly, like anybody, anyway, like a lot of the people I'm pretty, I'm like, fa- I'm like fans of, you know? So, yep. Um, well, Greg, man, I can't thank you enough for taking the time, dude. And uh, thanks for all your hard work over the years. I've definitely, like I said, I grew up watching all those trans world videos and everything. So I can't thank you enough, man. Of course. Thank you. So there you have it. That was the Greg hunt interview. I uh, just want to thank Greg so much for taking the time to come on the podcast. Uh, it's a real pleasure speaking to him about everything he's kind of worked on over the course of his career. Uh, like I said, I grew up watching the skate videos uh, that Greg uh, filmed and produced and directed. Uh, so c- can't thank him enough. Like uh, legendary videos like Sight Unseen and Minefield. Just amazing work. Um, so definitely go check out Greg's website at huntfilmwork.com. Uh, you can check out some more of his photos and um, some different video projects and films and whatnot that he's worked on on his website. As well, definitely go give him a follow on Instagram, at Hunt Filmwork. Uh, lots of cool posts on there. He's always pretty active, and you can kind of see what he's working on. Uh, so definitely give him a follow. And as always, I'll be having a weekly podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, as well as the Photo Banter YouTube page. Uh, so definitely go check out our YouTube page and hit subscribe. It'd be much appreciated. And as always, thanks so much for listening and take care.